Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks so much for tuning in and trusting in us to help you get a good night's rest. Simon will be reading to us tonight, and I'm so looking forward to you hearing our story. Sometimes our lives nowadays can seem complicated and overwhelming. Although modern conveniences are supposed to make everyday tasks easier, it can also quite easily go the other way and we soon find our schedules filled up with a different type of stress that simply didn't exist many years ago, when life seemed so much simpler. Tonight, we'll leave the modern world behind and spend a day exploring the sights and sounds of a renaissance fair. Of course, because this is a sleepy story, our journey will have all the charm of a true renaissance village, but with even more magic and fellowship. Now then, it's time to leave today behind, to put all physical distractions to one side, and let your mind follow suit parking anything it's trying to problem-solve until tomorrow. It's time for bed and for a good night's rest. So allow your breathing to just ease and draw out into a relaxing rhythm that encourages a greater sense of calm. And as you breathe, just focus on the way your body feels. Notice the points of contact with the bed below. Where does the body press deeper into the mattress? And where is there a lightness to that pressure? How about the blankets or covers keeping you warm? How does it feel to be cocooned within them, safe and snug, ready to rest? And just feel for any tension or achiness in the body at this time. If anything arises, then just use the calming, wave-like motion of the breath to invite calm and relaxation into those areas. All is peaceful, and you can enjoy this chance to rest. Now, let your mind drift away from the here and now, as though you're entering a dream. Drift farther and farther back in time, to an era when people rode horses, made their own foods and goods, and rarely left their own village. This is where our story begins. You find yourself standing in front of the gate to a walled city. Colourful flags fly on either side of the entrance, rippling cheerfully in the autumn breeze. You shield your eyes from the sparkling October sun 
and look up at the grey stone wall in front of you. A man in a velvet cloak stands atop it, waving a metal tankard about as he welcomes the other merrymakers assembled near you. Good day, fine people, he says. You turn and smile at your friend, who is standing at your side. You are ready to enjoy a magical day at the Renaissance Fair. The two of you walk through the shadowy interior of the entrance and emerge in another world. A charming village in the forest unfolds before you. Ahead, a dirt road is bordered by small buildings of medieval half-timbered construction. Tall trees cluster here and there, bowing gracefully over the dwellings creating a sheltering canopy. Evidence of autumn is abundant in the softly rustling orange, red and golden leaves that occasionally drift to the ground. From somewhere nearby, a light smell of wood smoke hovers in the air. Off to the side, a group of wonderfully costumed minstrels plays an animated tune with a panpipe, drums, and a tambourine. Not to be left out of the fun, two women wearing peasant costumes link arms and dance, kicking up their heels under their full skirts and clapping their hands on cue. This weather is the best October has to offer. The slight morning chill is melting into a day that is temperate and bright, with a fresh breeze that blows just briskly enough to invigorate you. From somewhere up ahead, the tantalizing scent of sugar and hot cider drifts by. You can tell already that you'll be tempted by some delicious fried dough soon. Walking slowly forward, you see the costume vendors first. In a row of small houses nearby, a handful of customers gather around the shop assistants. They're waiting to shed their mundane modern clothing for something more fanciful. A wide skirt, a flowing linen shirt, or a lace-up vest or bodice. Here at the fair, you can fully immerse yourself in fairy tales and become part of the story. Your attention is drawn to a family standing nearby. The parents are in ordinary street clothes, but their children are decked out in the Renaissance fantasy of their choosing. One little girl wears a silky pink princess dress, complete with a sparkly wand and a tiara that slips to the side of her head. Her sister prefers to play the colorful villain, fully concealed inside a green velveteen dragon costume. Her face peeks eagerly out of the open mouth with its jagged felt teeth. A regal couple dressed in the heavy finery of the nobility stops at their side and the man chuckles saying, Princess, I do believe you are plagued by a fierce dragon. Shall we call upon the knights of the realm? Both the princess and the dragon stare back in awe, unsure of how to respond, while the parents laugh. Then they nod and usher the children onward. The little ones spot a street performer who is making enormous pastel bubbles in the air and head delightedly in that direction. Your friend strolls ahead of you to examine a weaponry vendor nearby. The inventory is impressive. Metal swords of many different sizes hang along the wall. Each one has elegant engravings. 
With the owner's permission, your friend picks one up. He laughs when he finds it unexpectedly heavy. He says that he would certainly not be able to carry it around all day, let alone fight with it. The shopkeeper suggests humorously that one of the little wooden swords for children would be more to his liking. Your friend picks one of the children's swords up and nods approvingly. Much easier to manage. Leaving the swords behind, you wander next door to an essential oils shop. The most heavenly scents emanate from its rows of shelves and tables lined with bottles. You randomly select one bottle made of dark blue glass and gently remove the stopper to inhale. It turns out this one is spicy. Replacing the stopper, you move on to a different container down the row. Lifting it up to your nose, you decide it's quite different, a bit floral. An entire row of bottles in a brown color turn out to be citrus smells. They entice you with the aroma of lemons, limes, and oranges. Behind them is a row of dark green bottles. You uncork one, and the aroma that wafts from the bottle is a mixture of pine trees and spices, as if you're actually inhaling the month of December. The bottle next to it continues the winter theme with a delicious smell of peppermint. You close your eyes and see snowy landscapes in your head. Either of these would be perfect for the holidays, you think to yourself. You look around and realize your friend has moved on to watch a candle-making demonstration at the Wax Chandler. A woman in homespun, simple garb is showing a few children how it is done. She patiently demonstrates the pouring of hot wax around the wick, explaining how long it will take the candle to cool inside the mold. She talks about how bees make beeswax, secreting liquid that hardens into scales. A healthy worker bee can produce about eight to 12 scales in an hour, she says. The small onlookers are surprised to hear that it takes about 1,000 wax scales to make just a gram of beeswax. In fact, she says, according to the British Beekeepers Association, a group of bees must visit about 30 million flowers just to make a pound of beeswax. Hearing this, you begin to appreciate candles in a whole new way. Out of the corner of your eye, you see a woman selling flower wreaths that can be worn as a crown. You are irresistibly drawn to the sight of them with their many colored ribbons and delicate buds. You watch a woman who is selecting one. She seems to be in the autumnal spirit because she chooses one densely packed with flowers the color of a sunset. Red, orange, and gold blooms circle the crown, and a burnt orange silk ribbon falls from the back. The merchant compliments her on looking like quite a fine lady. Then, the merchant nods her thanks, putting the money she's been handed into a drawstring pouch at her waist. The new owner of the flower crown models her elegant new headwear for her friend and they walk off, laughing together. As you make your way deeper into the woodland village, you have the wonderful feeling that the best amusements lie ahead. A moment of decision occurs when you reach a fork in the road. 
hand-painted wooden sign points vaguely toward the amphitheater in one direction and the enchanted forest in another. Judging by the laughter and applause that is coming from the direction of the amphitheater, something very entertaining is going on there at the moment. After some discussion, you and your friend decide to head in that direction to check out the live performance first. You agree to visit the Enchanted Forest later. The enticing scent of warm pastry and powdered sugar is wafting towards you from somewhere up ahead. You follow the dirt path past a hat store and see that the delicious aroma is coming from a fried dough store. Inhaling appreciatively as you pass it, you emerge in front of a small open-air auditorium. The stage is positioned low in the center and wooden benches fan out in a half circle. A troupe of actors appears to be performing a Shakespeare play with some humorous adaptations. The audience claps and laughs with approval as the players cavort on the stage. Sitting down on one of the smooth benches in the back, you and your friend enjoy the show until it ends a few minutes later. You clap and cheer for the performers. When costumed players walk the aisle to pass their feathered hats for tips, you gladly contribute. You realize you're feeling thirsty, so you and your friend head over to the lemonade stand, where you each buy an enormous cup. The mixture of tart and sweet flavors is ice cold, with real lemon slices floating in it. It's so refreshing to sip on as you stroll onward. You've reached a part of the fair with some family-friendly entertainment. Children swing in a contraption powered by two very athletic men dressed in peasant costumes. The riders chortle with delight as their swing circles in the air. Next to that, both adults and children are trying archery. They shoot blunt arrows at hay bales, laughing as they widely miss their targets. The archery attendants joke with them. You might consider practicing some more before applying to the king's guard, they say, wagging their fingers in good humor. Your friend begins watching some people who are playing chess with huge black and white pieces that are as long as your legs. For some reason, it's vastly entertaining to watch them move these enormous figures around the board. You lean against a nearby tree and imagine what each player might do next, mentally figuring what your own move would be. One of the players steps forward and the breeze blows a leaf idly across his path. Your eye follows the leaf as it dances around the rook and then tumbles between two pawns, settling at the edge of the chessboard. Turning your gaze back to the player, you watch as he easily pushes his piece into a new position. Then he smiles at his opponent with an expression of triumphant delight. Your friend sips on his lemonade, no doubt mentally calculating the next best move in the game. He becomes very absorbed. Meanwhile, you're distracted by a jewelry merchant nearby. You stroll over to their display of rings, necklaces, bracelets and anklets. Your eyes roam over the heavy Viking-inspired rings, the bracelets with twisting leaves and Celtic patterns, and the necklaces embedded with gems of various colors. Your friend returns to your side 
and suggests the two of you should think about getting a seat in time for the joust. You can tell that the sporting arena is up ahead. The occasional sound of trumpets can be heard, followed by cheering from an audience. You leave the jewellery store behind and follow your friend toward the jolly sound of the crowd. There will be plenty of time for exploring more shops and other curiosities afterward. For now, you are focused on a seat at the big show. As you round another corner, the sheltering trees give way to a grand-looking ring encircled with bench seating. Many of the benches are already full as it's getting close to showtime. With only two of you to squeeze in, you and your friend are able to claim a couple of spots at the end of a long bench occupied by a family. Two of the three children have their faces painted in bright colours. The parents are trying to hand the oldest child an enormous roasted turkey leg, and he bites into it somewhat ineffectively. After a few tries, he hands it to his brother, who does the same. The third child, no more than a baby, sits up on his father's knee, wide-eyed at the sight of the activity around him. The performers have divided the spectators into two sides, assigning them a champion to support during the joust. The squires of the respective knights each walk the length of their side of the arena. They're making jokes at the audience and encouraging the spectators to cheer during the upcoming competition. When the regal king and queen appear, in the richly outfitted box at the head of the ring, you know the fun is about to begin. The people watching is as good as the performance. During the joust, you observe groups of revelers wearing all types of costumes. Just behind you, a rowdy collection of pirates exchange stories and jokes drinking from tankards that hang from their belts. Right next to them, a prim group of ladies appears to whisper together. They are wearing the full velvet dresses of noblewomen, and they each have structured headdresses and veils covering their hair. Across the arena from you is a troop of elves and fairies. The elves have marvellous pointy ears that make them look quite authentic. Everybody appears to be having a wonderful time. The good-natured jousting ends after much cheering from the crowd. Both knights ride their beautiful horses around the ring and awards are given by the king and queen with great ceremony. Afterward, the court withdraws from the royal box, preparing to parade through town and greet the commoners. The spectators slowly fan out into the adjacent food court, ready to enjoy some refreshment and perhaps watch a music or comedy show. At the moment, five women are dancing at a seating area in the center. As you walk past, you marvel at their smoothly coordinated movements. They smile brightly and exchange cheeky glances, merrily shaking their sequined belts in time with one another. The fairgoers are delighted, clapping with appreciation as each dance is completed. You are faced with a tantalizing array of food choices, ranging from smoothies to gyros to corn on the cob. In the end, you decide to get a shepherd's pie and your friend opts for a French crepe. You take your lunch and claim a seat where you can watch a juggler in a jester's costume who is also walking a tightrope. 
His skill is absolutely amazing, and the crowd shows its appreciation with generous applause. Your pie is delicious. With each bite, the flaky crust gives way to a hearty, fragrant filling that completely satisfies your hunger. Your companion is pleased with his delicate, sweet crepe. It is filled with hazelnut cream and dusted with powdered sugar. The food here is surprisingly good. You savour this moment, tipping your face toward the sun and closing your eyes, while the crowd laughs and applauds around you. Your friend brushes the sugar off his hands and points to a vendor he's interested in visiting. You relinquish your bench to some new arrivals and walk over to a merchant who is demonstrating and selling old-fashioned wooden games. Most of them are unfamiliar to you, but they come with instructions and are beautifully carved and painted. There is something so appealing about these lovely handcrafted boards and their playing pieces, which are bagged in simple linen and burlap. You take the game maker's business card and consider seeking him out again when it's time for holiday shopping. You and your friend agree that you still want to take a walk through the enchanted forest, so you head away from the food court to find it. On the edge of the clearing, people are clapping and dancing to lively music in a tavern. Out front, there is a pie-eating contest. People can pay to stand at a long table and then attempt to be the first to eat an entire chocolate cream pie without using their hands. There is plenty of humorous shouting regarding pie-eating technique, and whipped cream covers many faces. You and your friend both laugh and shake your heads. You are too full from eating lunch to watch this game for very long. Even using a fork, it's hard to imagine eating an entire pie that quickly. You see another wooden signpost indicating that you're going in the right direction to reach the enchanted forest. On the way, you are tempted to stop at one craftsman after another. Wizard capes and wands, rain catchers and wind chimes and dragon carvings are among the many wares being offered at every turn. You know that anything you buy must be carried with you, however. So you do not allow yourself to linger long in any of the shops, at least for now. Before long, the entrance to the enchanted forest appears ahead. You find the starting point and step onto the winding trail. It takes you into a dense cluster of gently swaying trees. The path leads you enticingly between mossy boulders and emerges near a whimsical collection of fairy houses. Birdsong and lute music is echoing lightly around you and the sunshine dapples the ground here, creating a magical and secretive atmosphere. You come upon some chairs that are made to look like huge toadstools, and each of you has a seat. You grin at each other with good humor. Even adults cannot resist an invitation to rest in such an adorable spot. You stretch your legs out straight in front of you and observe how the sunlight dances across your feet. Lifting your face upward, you turn your head left and right, seeing how the rays of the sun wink through the canopy of leaves above. 
Patches of blue sky are visible in places, and you see a wispy cloud drift across your view. Looking down again, you feel the gentle sun on the top of your head and take a deep, relaxing breath. After this moment of happy reflection on your woodland perches, you follow the trail farther. You approach a small clearing where several women, costumed as fairies, are performing an elaborate dance. Their chiffon dresses float around them and they all wear delicate floral crowns. Each one has a gauzy pair of wings on her back. Two of the fairies let go of each other's hands, breaking their chain, and they draw in a little girl who is watching, awestruck. You smile at the thought of how she will always remember this magical encounter. The fairies circle with the little girl slowly, singing softly as they rotate in their charming ring. And you're reminded of beautiful picture books you read as a child. The most magical thing about fairy stories is the idea that these carefree, magical creatures are always living quite near us, but unseen. To be whisked into that secret world is delightful to you. You can almost imagine for a moment that they are real. The trail you're following heads in a lazy circle back toward the entrance of the woods. But one of the most enchanting secrets of the forest is yet to come. A fairy queen appears in a hidden hollow, flanked by numerous elegant attendants. One is telling a story, and both the fairy court and the onlookers listen with delight. She ends by showering her listeners with rose petals. The storyteller tosses pink and red handfuls up in the air, and you watch them flutter slowly down, landing lightly all around you. Beyond the Queen's hideaway is a darling wooden bridge. You cross over it in small steps, stopping midway and peering at the babbling brook underneath. Your eye follows the water upstream and you see that it is pouring out of a small cave. It drops down a waterfall, flowing over several ledges, and then works its way to you in a winding path around moss-covered stones. You close your eyes and feel soothed by the gentle sound it makes as it disappears under your feet and continues past the bridge on the other side. You finish crossing the bridge and find yourselves back at the entrance to the enchanted forest. It was almost like a little secret escape into the tranquil heart of the fair. And now you have returned to the hustle and bustle once more. You find one path through town you haven't yet traveled and set out to explore it. There's a group of spectators standing around a stage up ahead. They're watching two acrobats. The performers are bending and twisting as a pair, with one repeatedly being lifted into the air. Sometimes the airborne acrobat will slowly rotate, extending her legs into different poses like an ice dancer. The performer underneath her must be very strong, but he looks as if he supports her with the greatest ease. Together, they are a beautiful sight, constantly moving in tandem to fold and unfold, to rotate and dramatically pause. 
Smiling, they take a bow and the crowd claps in appreciation. Midday has passed now and the sun that warmed the noon hour has become less strong. You can properly feel how autumn is coming on now as a cooler wind blows ever so lightly down this fanciful alley of another age. With the breeze comes a tantalizing smell of warm cinnamon almonds and sugared pecans. You close your eyes and inhale deeply, drawing your sweater a bit more tightly around you. Up ahead, you spy a honey vendor. Stepping inside his shop, you see that he is a local beekeeper and that he has a generous array of different types of honey available to try. Mason jars stand in front of you filled with honey sticks, which are thin tubes with a single serving of portable honey inside. The hand-lettered sign suggests that these trifles are perfect as stocking stuffers or to pack in school lunches. You imagine that it might be nice to have a few in your drawer at home to add to your tea. Above the honey sticks are full jars of honey in flavors like orange blossom and clover. It makes sense that honey would take on the flavor of the pasture where the bee was working. You decide to buy a variety of honey sticks choosing two each of five different flavors. These pack easily into your bag once purchased. You smile, thinking how lovely they will be when you break them out on a future winter day. Your friend points to a shop across the way. He has been wanting to take home one of the beautiful ceramic mugs he has seen available throughout the fair. Crossing to the nearby display, you both walk around a large selection of elegant tankards, each one appearing to be completely unique. There are so many options to choose from. You point admiringly to one that drips with various shades of blue and grey. Your friend likes that one, but he draws your attention to a slightly shorter, wider mug in lovely beige and brown tones. It feels earthy and appropriate for the season. He decides on the brown one and settles up with the merchant while you wander next door. A glass blower is at work here and you are mesmerized by the sight. All around him are finished vases, cups and votives in glorious colors. From behind the counter, he demonstrates his craft. He is working with red hot ovens and blow torches to shape a figurine right before your eyes. Using a pair of pincers, he takes a shapeless glowing orb and expertly teases a head and a tail out of it. He turns and shapes the red-hot material, and as he does, the colors shift within. As if the translucent figure were an orange cream candy with stripes and small bubbles running through it. Miraculously, a cat emerges. The onlookers are silent, as if uttering a single sound would ruin the picture he is crafting. The crowd silently wills him on with an eager desire to see him succeed. When the masterpiece is finished, they exhale with a collective sigh of happiness. The spell of the glassblower gently dissipates when you see a parade walking by. The king and queen 
are making their way through the town in the direction of the jousting arena, and many follow in their wake. Noble ladies in their elaborate headdresses smile graciously at passers-by. Meanwhile, their husbands nod to people on the other side, their feathered hats dipping ever so slightly in a dignified manner. At the very end of the procession are a couple of jesters, dancing merrily and playing tambourines and panpipes. The spectators wave and offer a hearty cry of huzzah as the royal court disappears around the corner. You realize that you've now come full circle and that there is no corner of the fair you have not explored today. By mutual agreement, you and your friend turn yourselves back in the direction of the main entrance, taking your time to get back there and soaking up the atmosphere as you do. As you meander down the street, you come upon the best sight of the day. In a bower nearby, an actual wedding seems to be taking place. The bride and groom are both dressed in richly detailed period attire. She is piled with jewel-toned velvets and is wearing a tightly laced bodice. Atop her head is a delicate, sparkling crown that glitters in the October sun. The groom is a perfect match to his lovely lady, wearing a velvet cape that appears to be trimmed in white faux fur. He wears a heavy gold chain around his neck and has a feathered velvet cap on his head. The couple are radiant, surrounded by a motley gathering of friends in different types of Renaissance costume. The regal officiant declares them to be married, and they share a kiss while their guests clap in celebration. The bride and groom recess from the bower, holding hands, and cheer to their guests that will be henceforth found at the tavern. A musician pipes a cheerful tune and leads the way as the company disperses, murmuring amongst themselves. Smiling ear to ear, you and your friend walk on, feeling as if you've had the perfect conclusion to your visit. As you once again pass the merchants displaying their incense, their candles, their beautiful woven garments and their art, you reflect upon what a lovely escape the fair has been. Whether you are a true Renaissance enthusiast or a fan of fairies, elves and the pirate life, this seems like a place where everyone can simply live out their dreams for a day. The enticing music of the minstrels at the gate floats past you as you once again pass through its shadowy door. As you leave the fair behind you, a man atop the wall offers you a final gift. Fare thee well, good people, he calls. You turn and wave to him, and he bows slightly, adding, See you anon. With the light rhythm of the tambourine fading in the background, you and your friend exchange smiles. You both know that the man is right. The Renaissance Fair will be seeing you again when next year comes around. <laughs>